Hi, everybody. Welcome to a very special edition of Inside AWAI. I'm Katie Yakel, uh, your Executive Director here, and I'm so pleased to be joined by Pam Foster, Direct AWAI's Director of Copywriting Training. Hi, Pam. Hi, Katie. Hi, everybody. And da 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 da, Bob Bly. Hi, Bob. How are you? Good. How are you guys doing? For those of you who haven't met Bob yet, um, you're in for a treat. Bob is a legendary copywriter. He has his book, the Copywriter's Handbook, has probably launched more copywriting careers than anything else in our industry. It was the only place for people to really even know what copywriting was until AWAI came along, and we're so grateful and appreciative of our long, long relationship with Bob and the, the great contribution he does and just how <coughs> generous and helpful he is to our members, to us, to, I, you know, I go on. <laughs> Thank you, Katie. I'm blushing, but you can't see it. <laughs> All right. So now today, this is an interesting um, subject for, for this discussion, and I'm glad we're really going to have the opportunity to dig into it. And again, Bob, is, it's so great to have your insight on this. You know, we, we talk a lot about the writer's life, and, and with that, we talk about the money that, that comes with it. You know, we're never embarrassed or, you know, we, money's good and money is, is part of the, the promise and, and the lifestyle because it does get you where you want to go. It, it gives you choices. It gives you freedom. And we focus on the six-figure income mark as, as, a, as a great um, a milestone for for uh, a great milestone to reach for, and then, then once you pass it and surpass it, uh, it, it encapsulates a lot of what AWAI has been about since the very beginning, is, is helping people create these lifestyles, and, and, and that's a pretty significant marker. Well, today, we're not just going to talk about one way of making six figures. We're going to talk about six ways, and Bob does them all. And uh, that's why it's so interesting to, to have his, his take on this. And uh, let's just get right into it. So our goals for today, there are more opportunities for you as a writer than ever. It's mind-boggling. Since 20 years ago when we started, 10 years ago, even just as few as just a few years ago, the opportunities for writers just keep growing and growing. And you have so many um, possibilities and so many options of creating a six-figure lifestyle for yourself, and it, you're not just locked into one lane anymore. So we're going to just touch on that. Like I said, we're going to talk about six different ways to make six figures a year from your writing skill, from the, the basic persuasion skills that you're learning, how those translate into uh, all these other opportunities. You're going to meet some other writers who are doing it. You're going to find out how they did it and then how you can do it as well. And then we're going to give you our top tips, resources, and answer, open up the lines at the end so that you can ask us any questions you may have. It can be about this topic or it can really be about anything. And, you know, it's such a, an amazing opportunity to have Bob with us. So. I, I encourage you to stick around and uh, get your questions in. So I touched on uh, my love for Bob, um, and I could go on and on. But, uh, again, as a more formal introduction, Bob Lai is an independent contractor and consultant with four decades of experience in business-to-business, high-tech, industrial, direct response, and information marketing. He does a lot of B2C, business to consumer as well. If you've got something to sell, Bob will find a way to do it. That's why it comes as no surprise that he's one of the most successful copywriters working today, as well as a standing ovation, top of the charts, always popular, popular speaker 
at any of our events, especially boot camp. I have the best vision of from this last year's boot camp of Bob sitting in the middle of the light of the Marriott lobby, just surrounded by uh, writers. And Bob, how long did those those we uh, sat sessions there. go on? We sat there, although some of the people stayed, others changed and were replaced by others. I sat there t talking to them for five oh, hours. At least. Oh, and it was just awesome. It was it was awesome. Bob is also a very prol prolific author. In addition to his jam-packed copywriting schedule and being an info marketer, Bob has written 100 books including the one that I mentioned, the Copywriter's Handbook. And uh, I, I heard number 100 just came out. What, what's the name of it? It'll be out next week. It's called The Big Book of Words That Sell, published by Skyhorse Publishing. Oh, wonderful. Oh, I love that. Well, I can't wait to read it. And people, let me just mention, can download a free chapter if they go to www.bly.com forward, forward slash sales. You get one chapter free. Oh, thank you very much. That's excellent. All right, so let's let's dig into this and let's really talk about why opportunities for writers are even bigger today than Bob when you started, Pam when when you started. And you know, these are part of the reasons. These are just some facts to consider. And this is these are mind mind boggling. If you just were to focus on one of these, it would, you know, but but especially when you add them all together. So I'm just going to run through this list. You know, there are 5.3 billion web pages. All those are need copy. They should be written by copywriters. And you just think about how many more are being added every single day. 293.6 billion emails are sent and received every day. Again, just think about those numbers. For any of those that are business related, a copywriter is writing those. About 50% of customers consume three to five content pieces before talking to a sales rep. This is, you know, a critical insight for any business to business writers for, or consumer as well. You know, it's about relationship building and the relationship happens through copywriting. It's through the communications that the company send out. And a lot, you know, it, it takes a little bit uh, for the, these relationships to start and take hold. So content pieces, you know, those are informational. Uh, they, they may not ask directly for a sale, but it's all about building a relationship between the company and the, the reader. 91% of B2B marketers use content marketing. That's, that's a huge number because that's how they educate. That's how they get their message out. That's how they form relationships. 73% of marketers use case studies. You know, this is something we're really hot on. We have these amazing programs that are giving you the skills to be case study writers. Businesses need these. It's, it's taking, um, it's really replacing almost what testimonials used to be. It's these in-depth stories of transformation of of how a company's product or service solved a problem for somebody, and and a case study allows you to go go in depth in that. Eighty-one percent of companies will maintain or increase direct mail this year. That and that we're not even talking about web web. Um, offers and web campaigns, we're talking about actually in the mail, traditional direct mail. So when you think about it, you know, these numbers are huge and this is what's adding to the, uh, the voracious appetite for copywriters because when you look at the common thread of all these things, all those things I just mentioned, it's persuasive writing, it's copywriting, it's what you're learning through AWAI. So we're going to jump into the first, and Bob, please feel free to jump in. Same with you, Pam. Jump in at any time. Um, I want this to be a conversation. I, I don't want to just be, um, uh, you know, running through these so so quickly. Well, I'm chomping at the bit, and I know Pam <laughs> likes, to, likes to take care of our students, so get ready for some foster care. 
<laughs> oh my gosh. Okay, everybody, you know. Good one. <laughs> How long have you had that in your back pocket, or did you just no, think of it? You know, I, I um, <laughs> you know, I uh, am a pun guy to my detriment, probably. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're going to jump into six different ways to earn six figures as a copywriter. And the first is direct response copywriting. Now, for me, anything that's persuasive, anything that gets you to take an action, I consider direct response. If, if it's on the, it doesn't matter what the format is. But for this little piece of this conversation, we're going to focus on uh, traditional direct response that is done through the mail, where a letter is written, it's sent to sent to somebody at home, they're, they take an action, and it's all trackable and measurable. So um, let, let's just use this example of, of writing a sales letter. Let's say it's for a financial advisory subscription. It costs $1,000 a year. That's, that's what your offer is. Um, for as From the writer's point of view, you negotiate an upfront writing fee based on your experience. It could be anywhere from $1,000 up to $25,000. You know, it, it, it really varies depending on the size of the company, the, the, what the offer is, I, you know. But let's just say here, if it's a, you know, we're, we're, we're going to uh, look, look at those, um, those ranges in a, uh, in a little bit. And um, oh, Bob. Yeah. Oh, I thought I I thought I heard you say so. Okay. And um, so then you, the letter that you mailed works. Uh, one percent of the people who saw it decided to to pony up the thousand dollars, and they actually subscribed. And you know, you might be thinking one percent. Oh, that's terrible. Actually, that's fantastic. That is a really great response rate because you'll see. That, that's a million dollars in sales and, you know, obviously a very happy client. Now, the best part is, in many cases, with traditional direct response sales letters, the copywriters are paid a royalty as well. And, again, it varies, you know, it varies greatly based on uh, experience and the type of offer and the, the company, but, you know, two, between 2 to 4% is not uncommon, and that's on top of the, the writing fee that, that you've been paid. So let's just say it was a 3% royalty. That's an extra $30,000 for a letter that you've already written, you've already been paid for, and will most likely be mailed again. And while you won't get your upfront fee again, that royalty will continue. We've been paying royalties. That we have one letter that we've been paying royalties on for 20 years. <laughs> I, I can't even imagine how much. I have never added up how much that writer's made, but it's substantial. And so now I want to, we want, we're, as we're going through this, we're actually doing the math so you can see how it breaks down and how it actually gets to $100,000 if you were just to focus on direct response. Um, so let's say you, you the upfront fee for that letter was $10,000. You had uh, $30,000 in royalties. That's $40,000 for that one project. And if you do six in a year, that's, that's $240,000. Now, you know, not every letter is going to be a winner. And not every... Um, letter, you know, you may not be doing, um, it may take you longer to write one and shorter to write another. So th these are just averages, but to, to think about it, if you had six winners in a year, that, that's what this could look like. If, if it does more, you could, do, you could do more, obviously. If you're more productive, if you're like a Bob and you, you, you can write quickly and, and uh, get these winners. But it's, this is just to show you that it's possible. And um, then to even break it down by month, you know, a, a sales letter a month could be $10,000 or, or every other month. It just is 
you are in control of it, and it, there is a pathway for you for you to get there. You know, some writers in our AWAI world that you've probably met if you've been on some of these inside AWAIs or that you may be familiar, familiar with, uh, I mean, we have dozens and dozens and dozens that are at this level and that are doing this. Um, but three, that if you click on these links when this goes live, it will take you right to their case stories. And they just have, they have great inspiring stories. There's Guillermo Rubio, Ray Robinson, and Marcella Allison. They all started at very different places and just have these thriving careers. And, of course, to learn more about the structure of the sales letter, really the heart and soul of direct response copywriting, um, your, the place to start is the accelerated program for six-figure copywriting. Bob, do you have anything you want to add to this piece of the, the conversation? Yeah, I, you said, and I agree with you, that you have to understand, people listening, not every promotion – you're going to write as a winner, but listen to this. Uh, Joe Sugarman said to me, and I think a bunch of us were standing around him after he gave a presentation, he said, my ads, he's known for his blue blocker sunglasses and other print ads, he says, for my ads, only one in ten is a big winner, and that one in ten has made me rich. So you yeah. do not need a high batting average. I mean, look at look at baseball. If you bat three hundred, you're making two hundred thousand, uh, two million dollars a year. Right. <laughs> That's a good point. I just wanted to mention, though, if anyone is wondering about the clicking on these, um, when we post the replay, the slides will be there, and you can click there to see all these case studies and program information. You can't click right now, but we wanted to set you up so you know that you can after it's posted on the replay page. And Bob, the other thing to I think sometimes people new to this business don't understand is that clients are okay if you know three out of ten are winners or you know one out of five. You know, th there's a lot of leeway there, right? As long as you gave your best effort and the client looked at your copy and said, "This is really good," they still expect that not everything's going to be a winner. And there are many examples, I mean, many reasons. But, for example, you may have written great copy, but you and the client picked the wrong USP or sales appeal. This happens a lot. A lot of clients, and this is what I do, I go back and say, well, let's revamp the package and let's try another sales appeal. And we come up with one that we think is better. We realize what our mistake was before, and you can turn many losers into winners. Yep. Yep. And because you're learning from everything that you're doing. And, you know, that, that's, the, that's the important thing. So, uh, you know, there's not a blacklist. There's not if, – if, if one doesn't work, th there will be another one. So um, – Absolutely. It, 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 it is uh, uh, a bit – it's definitely a numbers game, though. And I think a key is learning how to write quickly and um, – you know, accelerated failures, you know, all of those lessons definitely apply to, to copywriting, too. So the second way for a copywriter to earn six figures or, or more is through web online copywriting. Now, this starts with the same fundamentals that you learn in the accelerated program. It's really just a different format. There's some, some nuances that, that are different, but... The, the basic structure of making a promise, you know, having the right proof, painting the picture, call to action, that, that all applies. Those are, those are the fundamentals. But just like we did before, we're going to walk you through a, uh, a scenario. And this is something that uh, a client could ask you to, to, to do. It would be, a, you know, a, a great project. But basically what they want to do is, build a client list. They, they want to uh, get people to raise their hand that they're interested in some, you know, whatever their product or service is. So the first step in that would be to hire a copywriter to hire you to write an online report for them on, on the topic. Then an ad is written for that report. 
that's probably going to be used on Google or Facebook or, you know, some of the whatever social network um, on the social platforms. When the prospect clicks on the ad, they need to go to what is called a landing page. And that's where, that's also written by the copywriter. That's where the prospect gives their email and that's where they get the, the, the report that, that's being offered. Then once that has happened, that the person has raised their hand, yes, I want this, here's my email, send me more. There has to be a series of emails that go out to them that build relationships, that introduce new solutions that eventually, you know, ask for the sale. And you have to do that rather quickly because experience shows that 90% of the people who join your list, who, who, who join your list and buy, will do so within the first 90 days of joining your list. So if you let the names get old and stale, you're leaving money on the table. Exactly, exactly. Now, so that was, that scenario was about, you know, starting relationships, building a list for, for a client. Now, this scenario is meeting the ongoing needs. So the, uh, the list has been established. People, they have the group of people that are interested in, in knowing more about, about what they do. So in that case, they're going to need web pages that will need to be optimized. You know, we're, going to be talking a lot about search engine optimization in the next few weeks and months and just we're we're really focused on it within our company and so what we are, we're doing we we share and the lessons that we learn we we share as well so just how critical this is but once the, there there has to be information provided to these people who are asking for it so that's through web pages it's through e-newsletters, through blog posts, through video scripts, through, um, you know, more emails and more emails. I mean, it really never ends. Yeah, and I just want to throw in there that this is most of the work I do as a freelancer and have done pretty much my own entire writing career when once the web was really a thing. Um, most of the companies I work with have ongoing needs. So their website's stale, they need you to update all the pages or optimize them so that Google will find them and put them at the top of Google rank, uh, search uh, results. And then a, new, a newsletter is a wonderful thing because it goes on every month. You have to send a newsletter out every month and they get stuck on what to write about. So the copywriter goes, hey, I got a bunch of ideas and they can be a hero that way. Um, blog posts, same thing. There's a regular schedule. So um, you can't write a blog post and say, all right, I'm all done for the year. No, they're going to do two or three posts a month, um, maybe even more. And so if you're that writer, you just have a nice steady flow of work they need and you can count on. So it's pretty cool. And that adds up. Sure does. So, yes. Okay. And, and Pam really has this amazing uh, background and hands-on in the trenches experience in this world. And, you know, Pam, these are, these are numbers that you really advise us on, basically. And, you know, here's what you can earn for just some of the things that uh, clients are need and want to, are happy to pay you for, you know, home pages. That, that's big. That, that's, that's the, your your client's front door. That that that's how people first find them, and it's their first impression. You know, the range is is very wide, like you can see here. Subscription pages, information pages, landing pages. You know, I, I won't go through this whole list because I know you can see it. But these are all clients don't just need one of these; they need all of these, and they need them. They don't just need them once. They need them on an ongoing basis. So start developing a relationship. Become a company's go-to writer. And, you know, you'll see it's very easy to create a six-figure career for yourself. You know, if you did a 20-page website, an average price for that could be $10,000. If you did four blog posts a month, for, you know, 12 months, 
14,000 for promo email. You know, again, I don't need to go through this list, but you can see how it adds up and how they complement each other and how it makes sense that if you're having one conversation that you would be the person they would go to to um, have the, the full conversation. Here it is, you know, if you just have two clients, if you look at it on a, a monthly basis, you know, it's not a stretch. It's not hard to get to the point where you're making $10,000 a month just from, from two clients. Uh, a few AWAI trained writers who, again, once this is posted, which will probably be tomorrow, if you want to hear a little bit more about their stories, Heather Robson, Christina Gillick. But again, we could list dozens and dozens. And the best, absolute best source for learning about all these different project types, uh, learning how to write copy that is tailored for them, is our Web Copywriting 2.0 by uh, Nick Osborne. He's the leader here. He's, he's kind of um, created the whole art and science of persuasive writing for, for the web. Um, Bob, Pam, anything to add there? Well, the interesting thing to me is in the back in the day, and I've been doing this for 40 years, when you got an assignment to write a sales letter or a direct mail package, that was the assignment. But as you're pointing out here, when someone needs an online sales letter, there's tons of ancillary stuff. For example, um, you know, the client puts up a long sales letter and then says, I need an autoresponder sequence of emails, and there's 10 emails, and you get paid yeah. 800 per email. That's another $8,000. And then they're going to want to test them and tweak them, and, you know, it doesn't end. Yeah, absolutely. So there's, each project has more ancillary pieces that can be maybe smaller in price than the main sales letter, but actually add up to more money. Yeah. That's, and that's I just true. want to add that this is very, very common. Where, uh, clients who need web writers will never just hire you for one thing. Um, because they don't need one thing. They need someone who understands their business, and if you write their website, and then they say, well, we, we need, I mean, I write my accountant's website. They don't update it except maybe like four, every four years, but I help them write it. But they have a newsletter to their clients every quarter. I write the newsletter. Then they have something else they need. So because I know them so well, and this will happen for you, once you build a relationship and prove yourself through writing some material for a client, they never want to let you go. They don't want to teach somebody new. They don't want to shop around. That's not, they don't have time for that. So this is exciting because you become their expert, their go-to for everything. It's so true. It's so true. Okay, so now let's move on to the opportunities to make six figures as a B2B copywriter. Now, Bob, this is your backyard. This is, yeah, and Cam, yours, yours as well, too. I mean, yeah, you, you. Yeah, I started in B2B, business to business, so long ago that it was then called industrial copywriting. And the reason I gravitated toward that is I, I, when I graduated college, I graduated with an engineering degree, so this was a natural to me. You do not need to be a programmer or an engineer to do this, but that's why I was interested. B2B can deal with very simple products like office supplies or very complex products with enterprise software, and you choose the clients who, you know, who have products you're most comfortable with. Yeah, I just wanted to add that most of my career also has been in B2B because I happen to work um, and live in southern Maine, and most of the companies that were big enough to hire an in-house writer were B2B companies, insurance companies that were selling employee benefits. And then I worked for um, the veterinary industry where they were making equipment for veterinary practices to use. So I would say that you know, 80% of my writing background is B2B as well. And the thing that's so appealing and just makes so much sense for AWAI members as far as B2B goes is, so you know, so many people come to us after they've already had another career. And, you know, this is their second or maybe third or even fourth career. And the, the 
knowledge that you have, the insight into whatever industry you are on gives in, gives you such an advantage. You know, you know, kind of how it really works. You know the language. You know how the companies buy and sell from each other. So don't think that just because you're going to be a copywriter now, you have to throw out all the, the great work experience that you've had. There's, there's lots of ways to apply it and give yourself a, a boost and a head start. But we're going we're gonna to go through a couple scenarios here of how different um, project types can lead to six figures. And the first one is uh, lead gen, which is so important in B2B. This is when companies are looking for leads to give to their salespeople to, to cultivate, to make the, you know, to make the purchases. You know, a lot of times in B2B, it's big purchases that, that companies are making. Not always, but, but in a lot of cases. So there's a lot of collateral that has to go into it. There's a lot of moving pieces to give the salespeople the tools that they need to make the sales and to give the customers enough information. You know, it's, it's, these aren't emotional decisions. These are very rational decisions. And a lot of times, you know, layers of approval have to happen before these kind of purchases. So these are all things that um, companies want to have ready to uh, make available to whoever the decision makers are. So, you know, there's websites, of course, there's demo videos that, that show the product in, in action or show the solution happening, white papers, case studies, you know, these are things that, um, again, we're, we're very bullish on because they're, they're formulaic, they're, there's a huge appetite for them, uh, they're, they're, you get paid very well for them, and uh, there's, there's just a lot of benefits to those. You know, trade shows, if, you, if, if you've ever been to a trade show or, you know, you think about all the material that's actually needed, that all has to be written by a copywriter. E-newsletters, webinars, blog posts, emails, direct mail. You know, all of these different um, selling vehicles can be part of just one campaign. They can, they're, they're needed by different um, parts within the, the whole sales process. So, again, thinking in terms of, you know, what the, what the ranges are, uh, you know, websites can be up to $500 a page, demo videos, $1,000 per minute, um, white papers, five to 7000 case studies, $1,500 each. That, that's what we pay for them. And, you know, some companies pay, pay more, some companies pay, may pay less, but that's, that's a good solid price. You know, trade show materials, all the, the handouts and everything that, that goes with that. E-newsletters, you know, it's not uncommon um, to, to earn $1,000. Webinars, blog posts, you know, all of these things are, can be part of your monthly or quarterly or yearly um, retainers that, that you establish with, with, with clients. So again, here's the breakdown that you can look at of, of how it can add up to 20,000 with um, really just, you know, possibly one, one client. I mean, 100,000 with, with one client. You know, if you did a 20-page website, if you did two white papers per year, 12 case studies per year, you know, this is all very manageable. 12 issues of a newsletter. Um, if all that for one client, that's 60000 And if you have – and it, it, this is, you know, a minimal number of hours. If you're, if you're doing it that way, you can certainly have multiple clients. You wouldn't want to just have one client. You, you'd want to diversify a little bit. But, you know, one client, 60000 to 120, and uh, plus there could be other projects that come up as well. So, Bob, does that make sense to you? Yes, I agree with this pricing. And it's nice to have clients, and it is common to have clients in B2B who, who think of you as their copywriter and you yeah. do regular stuff. However, like when you say other projects, you do get one-shots. 
you get some. Sometimes I had one guy come to me and says, "We don't do much marketing. We need a brochure on our electroplating operation." That's all I did for them. They probably should have had other stuff, but they just wanted a brochure. I did it, and it was profitable and it was fun. Yeah, fantastic. And then just to you know even take it down to to the monthly. If you just did you know one of these things, you know one white paper or two case studies, that's ten thousand dollars or you know a 20 page website or a demo you know these are three ways of hitting that ten thousand per month mark and you know one month it may be one of these the next month it might be another or it's going to be a combination of things but I'm, I'm hoping that you're seeing how it's possible and I do encourage you to have a money goal in mind if it's a hundred thousand or, or whatever it is and then back into it. Okay, well then, how much do I need to make a month? You know, how many clients do I need to to hit that goal? And thinking in those terms, um, I, you know, I just find that it's it's easier to stay focused on it. And and actually, what happens is you you ramp up and you actually do more. That's been my from what I've seen in 20 years of working with people on that, that's typically what happens. Yeah, this is what I would – go ahead. <laughs> I was just going to say one more thing about this is if you get a client that is like a mid-sized manufacturing company uh, and they have you do some work for one kind of equipment and they're doing a big campaign for one specific type of equipment, it's very likely that they have several different product lines and each product line will have a marketing director or um, an uh, uh, account manager for that product line. And so they'll hear about the great job you're doing for this one piece of equipment. And they're like, well, I want that for my piece of equipment too, or my division. And so you suddenly become very popular within one company. I've seen that happen. And it's a lot of fun because you get shared among all the different account managers. <laughs> and you get to pick and choose, and you get to pick your schedule, and it's a blast. Uh, some some AWAI writers that uh, I encourage you to check out that are all thriving in D2B, uh, Keith Trimmels and Steve Maurer, and, of course, our own Pam Foster. She's, she's happy to give you her, her insights. And um, if you want to focus on being a B2B copywriter, I highly recommend um, Secrets of Writing High-Performing B2B Copy. It's by... Steve Sconlight, and I hope you know by now that we really, we go to the best for any of these programs, these specialized programs. We're going to people that are in the trenches, that have had years and years and years of success, that are not only great writers and great thinkers, but they're great teachers, and they understand that it's just as important for you to know how to build the business as it is to get the skills. So they always incorporate, okay, now that you've got the skills, here's how you turn it into a business. One last thing on this slide. Uh, the image on the right of that uh, tabloid publication is something I write every year for a veterinary conference. It's a giant global veterinary conference in Orlando every year. 17,000 veterinary professionals show up, and they publish a daily tabloid how-to guide, like how to get your way around and what the entertainment is today and what the featured uh, veterinary science talks are and all of that stuff. And it's uh, a fantastic project. And that's just one thing that I get to do in the industry um, that I love. So just, you know, be open to working in B2B. It's, it can be a wonderful, wonderful industry. Great. Okay, Pam, I'm going to slide the ball down to you, and you can right. take us home. Okay. So let me show, make sure I go the right way. All right. <laughs> the, the next one is called a money-making website. And so far we've been talking about working with clients, but this is where you create something of your own, your own asset. And um, a lot of com copywriters are doing that. And we mentioned Nick Usborne earlier. Um, he is pretty much our money-making website guru. 
he teaches people on how to create their own websites. And essentially, this is what it's all about. You take a popular subject that you're really excited about. Um, it could be food and drink, such as Nick's Coffee Detective website here. He's like the golden child of showing you how this all works. He makes a lot of money from this side thing he does where he just gets to talk about coffee all day long. He loves it. Um, it could be about pets, which is something I'm very heavily involved in. Um, gardening could be a passion. Parenting, new moms, or, or getting your kids through school, or, or things like that. Travel, there are so many different angles of travel that you could write about, from destinations to senior travel to um, the packing guru, how to, how to go on great trips with it, just to carry on. I don't know, I'm making that up. But there are all these different very popular, I, I call them fan base kind of topics where there, there are always audiences for these kinds of subjects where they're going online and looking for interesting content or how to solve a problem or how to make a great uh, event happen or how to make a cake even or just the how-to aspect. And if you're writing a website like that, you'll get traffic and, and then you can monetize it. So here's a woman who was part of AWAI, and then she launched her own website called The Work at Home Woman, and she started writing on ways that, that um, stay-at-home moms and other uh, people who are work, want to work from home and don't want to go and do the commute and corporate cubicle land and all that stuff, different ways they can make money. So um, that she she started just writing about it, and then it exploded into this multi-blog, multi-faceted uh, resource for anyone who wants to work from home. And look on the, on the right, those are all ads. And that's, how, that's partly how she's monetizing this. Because she gets so much traffic all day long that uh, people will click on ads that are relevant to what they're looking for, and then she gets a commission from those ads. So she answers questions, she provides tips and ideas, she reviews products. These are all things that you can do. And then you build a following, and um, not only can you make money from ads and uh, promoting other stuff that then people go and buy and you get a commission, you can start selling your own products too on there. Um, so that's what we really call a money-making website. Again, these are the ways. This website here is Christina Gillick's ComfyEarrings.com, which is about a certain kind of earring that doesn't poke your back of your neck when you're wearing them. <laughs> um, and, it, and it's very niche focused, but there is a following for this. And so she has a lot of different ways that she's making money from that. And um, so that's something that you could do yourself. Just pick, you know, a topic that you have some knowledge in somebody has a, a money-making website called tomato dirt and it's all about growing tomatoes which is wildly popular here's how you add it up to six figures now i didn't put specific numbers in here because every model is different but when you combine all these different ways of making money you can easily build up to six figures over time it doesn't happen overnight uh, I think Nick Osborne says that after several years of building that audience and building all the content, which has been a labor of love for him, he now makes seven to $10,000 a month while just letting it hum along, just from traffic that comes in from all of this great content. So that's kind of the goal. And Holly Hanna is the woman who uh, created Work at Home Women website. Kathy Widenhouse created Tomato Dirt. And she has a couple of other ones, too. I think something on cookies. <laughs> and anyway, it's fascinating. You really can have a great side business doing this. Um, I, I would say as a writer right now, you probably want to add this as a second thing and write for clients for a while and make money now while this is building traffic and building a presence. Um, we do have a program called How to Write Your Own Money-Making Websites, which is extremely popular. And on that, uh, if you sign up for that, you can see what other members are doing. That is really, really cool. Um, the next one is something that we talked about a little bit with clients who end up working with you. You can repackage and repurpose and consult for a client. So let's just say Gordon Graham is the guru of writing white papers, but Bob's written white papers, I've written white papers, 
if you start with a really great white paper, and what that really is is a document that um, is very helpful in the B2B world for decision makers to see how a, a, a service or a product can solve a, pro a common problem. If there's a new way to solve a problem or if they did a study and they had these incredible findings, that's worth something to the B2B buyer. So you take the white paper that you've written and you've done all this work for $7,000, like you've conducted interviews with um, customers or manufacturers or both. Um, you've done other research such as finding statistics or what are, the, what are the problem here that you're trying to solve. You might even do a survey and then you write an outline and you develop the entire piece, usually about eight to 13 pages and you get seven grand, right? Okay, are you done when you're done with that? No, this is the excellent part. And Bob, I want you to chime in on this too, but you can turn that white paper into a whole bunch of other content pieces that support that lead generation effort. So you could turn it into a, a long blog post, a video script, an ebook, a social media post. I, I could go on and on, but you can see here all the different iterations from that first initial content and the research that went into it, how it can be played out in all these different ways that have value to your client. And guess what? You can charge extra for each one of these things. Bob, do you have anything to add to this? Yeah, they don't, no, well, you said they don't expect you, they don't say, well, uh, we have a white paper. We want, why don't you take this page and make a, uh, a press release out of it, and we've already paid you for the white paper. No, they expect to pay your normal fee, not a reduced fee, your normal fee for any content that's in the white paper that you recycle or repurpose into any of these formats. And there's plenty of opportunity to do that, and they actually prefer you to do it that way because after you've written the white paper, which is the biggest document and the most detailed, they figure you know you've already done the learning, so you know that you know they don't have to retrain you. Yep. So speaking of the extra fees that you can charge, um, I added up. This is just an example based on the fee ranges that we know. And uh, by the way, on AWAI, we have a pricing guide for free where we're pulling these fee ranges from. And you can just go to awai.com and in the search bar, put in pricing guide and you'll find that free download. But anyway, I added up to 17,650 plus for turning the white paper, which is the first item there, $7,000, into all of these other pieces. That's just one campaign. Now think of, like I said, a, a B2B company that has several pieces of equipment and they might be doing a number of campaigns and there might be a big trade show coming up. They're going to need all this stuff. And if you've written the white paper, you are the go-to writer. Um, so simply rinse and repeat with several white papers a year. For instance, if you did six white paper projects a year, one every month, um, I think I meant eight thousand yeah, dollars, not I eight. Think so. <laughs> I don't know what happened there, but um, and then a hundred thousand dollars. Somehow I, I I had a senior moment and didn't fill out the rest. But if, as you can see from, from this this slide here, if you had like six projects a year that are core white paper projects, and then added these other pieces, take seventeen thousand dollars times six. Amazing, right? So um, well over six figures there. Now, Gordon Graham is uh, the person I know the most who's doing this. I know a lot of B2B writers are doing this, and, and Bob, you even said you have. I have. Um, but he is he's that white paper guy. That's his brand, that whitepaperguy.com. So if you ever want to see someone who is a, a total pro on white papers, he's the person, and he does write several programs for us on B2B copy. Um, his, his white paper program is how to write white papers that command top fees. You can see that on the bottom left. And then finally, drum roll, writing and selling information products. And this is Bob's expertise extraordinaire. As a matter of fact, I'm gonna show you his examples. Um, if there are many ways to do this, but a, a very common way is to write an ebook that appeals to a large audience. In the case of Bob, he wrote, the world's easiest and most profitable product to create and sell online. 
it's an ebook about writing ebooks, <laughs> right? We'll call it our ebook on ebooks. Right. <laughs> and guess what? You're a writer. So you are the perfect person for information marketing because you don't even have to learn what, like, let's say a lawyer wants to do this. They First, they have to learn how to write persuasive copywriting and, and copywriting that we teach. But you guys already will know copywriting. So then you can start creating books on topics of interest and you'll build a list and then you keep selling memberships, more ebooks, video classes, live events, masterminds, top level consulting. Um, Bob, tell us a little bit about how this has been such an enormous part of your business. I, my formula that I've come up with, although I, I do all six of these things, I tell people, if you want to make a good money and be financially secure as a freelance copywriter, you should have one profit center th that at least, but one profit center that earns you six figures, and we've looked at several, for, with active income. But like copywriting, it, it's a great source of money. You, but, you know, the only drawback except that aside from royalties, you, you, know, you have to keep writing. You have to keep working. Now, I like that, but, it's late, you know, there's labor continually. So I say you should have one active income source that makes you $100,000 a year or more, and now develop a passive income source. You only need one that also generates uh, a hundred, you know, six figures, uh, 100, 200, 300 grand, which which my uh, internet marketing business does. And uh, now, if for some reason your copywriting clients all went away. Uh, you'd still have your six. You'd still have your six-figure income. And here's the something that I that people may not realize: copywriting is a great job, and I love doing it. But it is labor intensive. We're like a dentist. Dentists have a saying: uh, the more you drill and fill, the more you bill. But <laughs> but I make a six figures with this business. I don't put more than an hour or two. Uh, a week into it, so the per hour I'm actually making much more than I am doing copyright. Right, and I, I just wanted to show you if you go to bly.com, you can see tons and tons of eBooks and other products that he has created over time that now practically sells in while he's sleeping. I mean, they they the traffic comes in, or he's got an email following. He'll send out emails that say, hey, you know, here's a here's a reminder that, um, I don't know, give me an example, Bob. Uh, here's a great example. Okay. My, my, my kids like Korean food, and on an impulse on a Friday night uh, after I checked all my emails, we drove the Korean restaurants very close to here. We drove, we ate the dinner, and we came back within 90 minutes. When I turned my computer on, we had sold $983 worth of products while I was eating. Yeah, that's awesome. And then um, I don't know if you have a subscription service at all, but some information marketers do. Yeah, what the, I don't have a paid subscription service. Okay. And, uh I, I, you know, and I don't really do uh, mastermind groups. Uh, I do some live events, and but I will say that if the way to raise prices or to command premium prices on information products is to combine multimedia, multiple media. For example, you could have a, uh, a you know, a, a set of eBooks, but on a particular topic and then create a course on them. That's one thing we don't have here, course. You can create hmm. an e-course where you, you, you release the lessons uh, one a week or two a week right. via pre-written autoresponder emails. That's another way to make money online, and you can charge more for that. Yep, I, I put video training, and maybe I, I was thinking that was the courses, the e-courses, like online video, but um, I see what you're saying, too. It could be yeah, video. Well, we yeah. We do both, you and I, we both do video training, and mm -hmm. we also have online audio courses. Yep. Okay, cool. And uh, to add it up to fi uh, six figures, you know, Bob was saying when we prepared this presentation that it's really all about 
what you can make selling multiple units such as ebooks plus any subscription fees or consulting fees or other things that you feel like offering through your information marketing business. Um, one example is if you sell a thousand ebooks a year at $29 each, that's 29,000 a year. If you sell 1,000 subscriptions at $29 each per month, that's $29,000 a year. I might, uh, 20,000, sorry, $29,000 a month. I was going to say, not a year. <laughs> but, but you can see like right there, that's almost 60,000. Uh, you can see how it can add up. And you, it, you build it, you don't have to keep building it so much. You build a lot of it up front, and then you keep promoting it and growing your audience. Now, if you're a solopreneur like most of us, a smaller operator, we use that term, mm -hmm. I will tell you that if you want to make 500000 a year on online sales, and I don't quite make that much. I make multiple hundreds of thousands, but not that much. If you want to make $500,000 selling products, information products online, it is easier to have 10 sites that do 50,000 each than to try to build one site that does half a million a year. Not that people don't do that anymore, but for the small operator, it's, it's, it's easier. So what would you say are different sites that you have then? Well, I have, it, really what I have is landing pages. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, I have mainly landing pages. I do have a membership site, which is, uh, unfortunately fairly inactive because I haven't had time to keep up with it but that's mm -hmm. another way to make money you know people join uh, become members of your of your site and for a, a small fee monthly they can access a lot of your content on that site and yeah. that's you know and that's like I'm, I met a guy who's a career coach he's not a, an internet marketer and he put up a membership site and I don't know what he makes as a career coach, probably good money, but he told me, he says, I make 100000 a year just from my membership, membership site. Wow. Okay. So that's an idea for you guys. And uh, we have some other AW, sorry, AWI, <laughs> AWAI members who are doing this. One of them is Roy Furr. Another one is Ed Gandia and Susanna Perkins. They all do information marketing. Ed Gandia pictured here is a B2B business building consultant. So if you want to become a B2B writer, he has a whole program online to teach you how to do that. And he does programs through us, of course. Um, to learn more about information marketing, we have Bob Bly's program, uh, linked to on the bottom left here, Information Marketing for Freelance Copywriters. And it's fantastic. I, I can't think of anyone better to teach this than Bob. So you'll want to check that out. And those are our six ways. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. If I can mention one thing, the problem yeah. with getting into for a single person for getting into internet information marketing is that it's all writing. So most people can't write the content, the special report or the ebook, and they can't write the copy for the landing page, the emails, and and to get it done professionally is is too expensive. They're not big companies. They're again solopreneurs. But if you're a copywriter. You already know how to write content like ebooks and reports. You already know how to write email and landing pages. You have a tremendous advantage over anyone else who wants to get into internet information marketing. Yep. Now, Bob, you already touched on this, but we're going to reiterate it. Multiple income streams rule. You want to try and mix active and passive, like Bob said. You know, you can pick one of what we mentioned, direct response, web copy, B2B, money, and, and then add something that's more passive, like the money-making website and the information marketing um, service. And, Bob, you, you just wanted to mention a few other options to add to yeah. that. If, uh, yeah. uh, we already talked about membership sites, which are passive income. Some people like to work as marketing coaches, uh, like uh, Ed work, offers coaching uh, and uh, others offer coaching that's more of like a one-on-one -on -one service to help people achieve their goal. Uh, professional speaking is a really good way to add extra income. 
uh, you know, speaking uh, at, association, at associations and corporate uh, events can pay really, really well. Teaching, uh, that's less uh, lucrative, but I, I taught for several years at New York University. I taught uh, technical writing and copywriting, and it also is a nice credential. You know, I say in my bio, Bob Bly has taught copywriting at New York University. People, for some reason, are impressed by that. And book <laughs> author, you know, you, you may not make a fortune on the books, but you'll make money in two ways. The, the rel royalties over time can add up significantly, and also the book, a lot of people will see your book, let's say if it's about copywriting, in my case, and they will call and hire you because you are the guy or gal that wrote the book. And I can I can second that. If if you are in a niche industry such as me, I was in the I am in the pet and veterinary industry. You can write a book on marketing for that industry. I wrote a book a while back with a co-author, wildly profitable marketing for the pet industry, and just having that book created and we self-published it but it was the best business card in the world and we actually wanted to use examples of different companies who are marketing well in the pet industry and so we contacted them and featured them they ended up hiring us it was amazing so a book can lead to lots of great things even if it's not like on the new york times bestseller list <laughs> so and you said I, it was your brochure jeffrey lant who's an old school old time marketer said a famous quote, a brochure, a, a book is a brochure that will never be thrown away. Yeah. Um, and Katie, I know that when we were putting this together, you wanted to talk about how having multiple income streams takes the pressure off, having only one source. I well, I think that, that has proved itself. And, uh, I, you know, Bob has, has hit on that. And uh, it's just, sound financial planning, I, in my mind. The analogy or metaphor I use is, if, if you think of income streams as, as tires, if you're riding a unicycle, you have one tire. If that tire goes flat, you're stranded. But if you're driving an 18-wheeler, a big truck, if, if a tire blows, you can keep going. If a second tire blows, you can keep going. In fact, if a third tire on an 18-wheeler blows, you can keep going. And that's the difference. Think of the tires as income streams and the analogy holds. I love it. Yeah, love that's it. great. That's perfect. We are we are we have some great questions here. I've been marking okay. them. So I'm just right. gonna run through them if you guys are ready. And now's yep. the time. If if you have any questions, um get them in the, the Q and A box. I, oh, first of all, Pam, just Susan's asking, you know, we, the statistics that we had early on, um, do you know where they came from? I'm, I'm sure we got them from one of our researchers or one of our copywriters, but... Uh, oh, that I, was me. That was me going all over the web, and I'm so sorry I was realizing that I didn't put the sources on there. But they're from places like HubSpot.com and Content Marketing Institute and um, uh, Search Engine Land and places that are very reputable marketing websites that, that publish tons of digital marketing uh, data every year and uh, statistics. Perfect. Uh, she, Susan also wants to know, um, and Bob, we'll put this one to you. When you do a revamp, let, let's say your letter does okay, doesn't do great, and you want to take another shot at it, or you, you know you talk to the marketer and you decide to to try it one more time, um, do you get an additional fee for that, or is that part of the relationship and you the hope do, of you getting you do get an additional fee, and the way you negotiate it is. And I, I did this recently. Not everything I write uh, does well. I did a, a package that the client liked, but we picked the wrong theme. And after we, uh, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty, we realized why it didn't work. So, we, you know, I came up at no charge with a, a, a memo that listed some alternate themes, and he actually says, I want to do three of them. So now I'm doing three versions. And... Your, my fee depends on how, how much of the original has to change. We decided the, mainly the body of the long letter doesn't have to, but the outer envelope teaser has to be different. The lead 
of the letter has to be different. The close has to be different. And so we decided that um, yeah, and it was a fairly large fee for, for each letter. So my fee would be uh, 25 or 30 percent of the original for each version. So it doesn't sound like a lot, but if, if you know if the original was 10 grand and the versions are three grand yeah. each, and I do three, it's nine grand. Right. And uh, a lot of times, if you even if you do have a winner, and um, the but the marketer wants to test it again and tweak it and and keep it fresh. Um, Sometimes you get a fee for that, but other times if you're getting a royalty, it's just understood that that's in your best interest to to keep the the letter alive as long as possible. So, you know, there, there's no absolutes or right or wrongs here, and it really is all about having open conversations and, and dialogue with, with the clients and, and talking about these. As Elise um, Benin likes to say, it's case-by-case case basis. Yes. Yes. Um, Andrea is asking when we were going over some of the price ranges for the products, but specifically in um, like the copywriting and, and the B2B, uh, just the, the, range, the, the uh, ranges were so wide. And she's asking how does she determine where she fits? And Pam, why don't, why don't you answer that? Yeah, I would say for a lot of things that I did, I started out on the lower end because I was fairly new and I felt more comfortable charging that. And, uh, you know, I wasn't feeling like I was selling myself short or anything. But um, with experience, then you feel more confident charging more. Um, sometimes you'll talk to a client and you'll say, what's your budget? And they'll give you an awesome budget and you're like, all right. Let's go. So you don't even have to worry about where you fit in. If they say, well, we, we're happy to pay $300 a blog post, then you're good to go. Um, and then the only other thing that I say, too, is if you're just starting out and you want to work with a company you know down the street or something, and they don't have a lot of money, but you can get a, a, great, exa a great sample of your work, and a testimonial, then you might charge the lower range or even lower to get that momentum going. Yes. Well, I did and much as you did, but I'll give you an anecdote. I had been freelancing for at least five years, and a guy in my neighborhood who, who I knew a little bit was a writer, uh, I forget, newspaper articles or whatever, and he wanted to get into copywriting. So he told me, I, I, I gave him a lot of help, showed him a lot of stuff. He told me like a month later that he was writing brochures for international paper and what he was charging for those brochures, I hadn't, you know, I hadn't gotten to that fee level. It took me five years to get to that fee level. So I concluded maybe I was wrong or maybe I was stupid and maybe Joe was right and, you, you know, you should go in high right away. I don't normally do that, but, um, you know, people have done it and been successful with it. Um, Andrew's also asking about how large are the clients that pay this much. And, you know, I'll just jump in for that. You know, obviously the size of the company dictates what their budget is. If it's a small mom and pop, again, it, it might be worth it to get the experience of not just having a sample but of actually working on a project all the way through. The larger companies, they'll pay more. It, it also has to do with the, um, the scope of the project, how much is involved, well, how, how expensive is the project. Uh, or, you know, the product that's being sold. So there, there's lots of variables. We have um, so much great information in helping you navigate all this and ne negotiate this. So I wouldn't worry about it at this point, especially if you're just getting started. The big thing is, is get the skills down and then start your, um, your process in, in getting clients. And I promise the rest of this will, will fall into place. And, uh, you know, we're just here to support you as far as that goes, getting you the, the confidence and the information that you need. Uh, Lynn is asking, how long would you typically spend writing a white paper? So, Bob, do you do, you do many white papers? Uh, I used to do more. I still do a fair amount, nothing like Gordon. I actually happened to – I just handed one in to a client, an enterprise software client, this morning. Uh, so, and uh, – I did one, another one also fairly recently, but uh, I don't really 
time myself, but if I had to, you know, some go faster than others. This one, uh, you know, the client provided a lot of background information. Uh, it was a subject that I was somewhat familiar with, and I did write it in basically a day. But normally I would allow, I would ask for two weeks. I'm not going to work on it every minute of those two weeks, but, you know, there are, as you're, as you're working on a white paper, you may need additional information, either from the client or the you research on the web, and you may want to, you may say to the client, hey, I don't have an explanation of technology X, and they'll set up an interview with a subject matter expert. So you have to, you have to leave time for that. Right, and and research and and uh, you know digging in is part of this, and it's what excites so many people about it because so many people that like to be writers love this kind of research that goes along with it and discovering and finding finding new ways of saying things. So Pam, uh, I see Pam that you had written in a couple of weeks as well. So I I think that's safe, and I'm I'm pretty sure that's what Gordon. Um, yeah, that's a reasonable figure. As well. Yeah. Okay. Here's. <laughs> Here's a, a, a easy to answer question. Um, how long should an ebook be? I said there's well, no right answer, but we'll ask. There's Bob no right answer, expert. but if you're charging, let's say, twenty nine to thirty nine dollars for a modestly priced ebook, it it should if it's much less than fifty pages, you know, it's only ten pages or twenty pages, the reader may feel it doesn't have enough weight or gravitas. So I try to make my ebooks that are 29, 39, 49, at least 50 pages. Good. Great. Um, oh, this, uh, this is an interesting question, and I see Pam's answer, but I, I want to just bring it up even though uh, Pam, you did give a great answer here. Lisa's asking, when do you know that your copy is done and ready to send to the client, especially as a writer who edits continuously as you write? Um, and Pam responded, you know, it is something that, that just comes with experience. You get a feel for it. You know, there's, there's checklists and there's, there's ways to go. But there does come a point when you have to let it go. And, Bob, I'm going to get your take on this in a minute. But the thing I just want to point out right now is that clients are expecting, they are not expecting perfect first drafts. They're expecting it to not have typos. They're expecting it to be clean and and follow the structure that we teach and, and you know, have all the, the pieces there. But it, it's not the type of relationship or situation where you send it in and you're first draft and, and you're done and you're on to the next one. I don't know really of any instances where that happens. And, you know, even with, with Bob, we go back and forth a few times. That, that, that's the nature of this. It's very collaborative that way. So um, don't put so much pressure on yourself that, you, that whatever you're turning in has to be perfect. Know that there is some back and forth that, that happens once it's turned in. Bob, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I hate to not answer it now, but I made a video that precisely – it answers the question of how do you know when you're done. So if people go to YouTube and go to the Bob Lye channel and then click on the video that says the exponential curve of excellence, it's only two or three minutes, and it explained this because I'm an engineer in a very quantitative way. But Michael J. Fox had a simpler explanation similar to what you said. He says, I aim for excellence, not perfection. Good. Good. I love it. Um, Amy's asking, she's interested in info marketing, and how do you find clients who might need landing pages? I mean, it's a it's common just, request. Uh, I haven't particularly marketed uh, specifically to clients that need landing pages because today info marketers need landing pages, but consumer products companies use landing everybody pages. Everybody does. And and everybody people, does. Yeah. Yeah, and B2B uses tons of landing pages. So any, almost any client you get, probably nine out of the ten clients you get, one of the things you'll, you'll almost invariably be asked to write is a landing page. And I, I am Amy and, and everyone else I can see, I just uh, copied a link in, um, under your answer here that has a great session 
that we did, uh, a previous Inside AWAI, that talked about 26 ways to find, find writing clients. And, you know, some are you doing outbound efforts, others figuring out how to get them to come to you. We, we, we kind of bucketed by uh, people that are extroverts, introverts, or, or in between. So it's, it's not so much about finding clients who might be landing pages. It's really just finding the clients that you want to work with. Exactly. And then, and then the project types will fall into it. You know, another way is check out, you know, companies that you want to write for. If you think you could improve their landing page, you, you might want to reach out to them and do it in a very tactful way because you never know who wrote the landing page. It could be the person you're writing to, so you don't want to say, oh, you know, this stinks and I'm, I'm here to save the day. Uh, you might just want to say, you know, hey, I was looking at this and, and I know the thing that excites me most about your company is this and I noticed that it's not on here. You know, maybe it's something I could write up for you or, you know, there's, there's ways of going about it tactfully. But um, – I, I would focus in on the clients you want to write for and then seeing the project types that they that they need. Um, okay, this is for all panelists. Suggestions for ebook topics. So I guess she wants to write an ebook and she's looking for uh, some topics. Well, Pam or I could answer this, so could you, Katie. The key is not what the topic is, although I can get to that in a second. The key is all your information products have to be about the same basic topic, whether it's gardening or uh, CrossFit. You don't do an ebook, one ebook on gardening, one ebook on lifting weights, because the people on your list are going to come to you for for your knowledge in one thing. So the ebooks, the audios, all have to be, you know, address the same common core area of knowledge. Having said that, there's a couple of rules. Paris Lampropoulos pointed out to me or, and told me, he says, ebooks and information products on hobbies sell very well. We've also found that ebooks that tell you how to make major purchases, such as buying a house, buying a luxury car, sell very well. And uh, Ebooks that are instructional in in the topics of starting a business, making money, having great relationships, dating, you know, the, a few core common things also do well. Good. Pam, do you have anything to add to that? Katie, I think Pam was... Uh... Her, her screen froze, she said. Oh, okay. All right. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a last call for questions. Um, we'll answer everything that's in here. Um, but let's see. So, Anthony. Hey, Anthony. Boy, I haven't seen you in a while. It's nice to see your name again. Um, he's asking, are Adobe and Microsoft Word programs acceptable for making eBooks? And is there a particular format to follow? Well, Bob, we talked about this in the ebook program you did for us, right? Right. The uh, it's not so much uh, what what software you use, but here's the answer: you you want to the, the ebook is published not let's say you write it in Word. The ebook is not published as a Word document. It's published as a PDF that is locked, so no one can change or steal it. If it's unlocked, someone could put their name on the front cover instead of yours and sell it behind your back. In terms of the format, it is generally similar to a special report or a small book that is divided into chapters or sections. It should begin with a table of content and there are and the organization of this information depends on the subject. If I was writing an ebook on a guide to vitamins, well, one way to do it would be alphabetically. If I was writing an ebook guide to uh, how to become a, you know, a content writer, I would do it chronologically, step by step. You do this first, then this, then this, then this. So the the or, the organization of the content will follow 
uh, is, is dictated by the subject matter largely, and the, the format is pretty standard. Uh, again, pages that look like a book, maybe have bigger type, uh, and um, you know that are done in uh, you know in in whatever typeface of word you want, and then converted to an e to a PDF. Great. Okay, we have two last questions. Um, this is from Lisa. When researching anything online, what do you look for to ensure the source you are using is valid and true? Bob, you're such a great researcher. researcher. Um, I mean, other than just knowing the, the source, is there anything else that you do? Well, what you don't want to do, you, let's say you're writing something for the health market. Uh, you don't want to search, let's say, uh, curcumin and have it take you to a site of a company selling curcumin as a, sup as a supplement because they're promoting it. That's marketing. Right. You, you right. want to, like when you're writing health, I'll just talk about that as an example, the, the best sources of information are peer-reviewed journals that publish double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled clinical studies. And in each field, there, there are legitimate sources of information, and uh, you know, one one good source is uh, association websites because they most mm -hmm. of them don't have a big axe to grind. Uh, other sources are university websites that'll have research available to you. I use for health Harvard Medical School and the Mayo Clinic, not because just because they're good, but because of my copy, I could say. Harvard Medical School researchers reveal it's a selling point. Yep, yep. And again, just use common sense. Use if if it's good enough for you, if it proves the point to you, if it if it uh, would satisfy you, then you know, as long as it's you know, as long as it can be cited, and you do want to save all your sources because you're going to want to turn that, your client's going to want to see that if you are making any kind of claims. Um, uh, I, I think a, a lot of it is, is common sense there. Yeah, but avoid, okay. don't cite Wikipedia or Quora, because those are, those are people's individual opinions, and they're not expert written. Good. Perfect. That, that is good. Awesome. All right. I just I do want to just finish up these. You know, we've, we've had a lot of questions about uh, concern about graphic design. Do you need to know graphic design? How do you submit your copy? Um, very quickly, submit in a Word document. If you have ideas for how big the headline should be, whatever you can do within the Word document, that's great. If you have ideas for what kind of image, you can put those in in footnotes. It is not your responsibility to actually do the design. The client will either have an in-house person or they'll work with a person. Um, but you, you just have to focus on the, the content itself, and it can be delivered in a Word document. That's fine. Um, then uh, let's see. I lost a couple of these questions here. I think we, got, we took care of them. Are they in? Okay, great. Um, Oh, this one I wanted to ask. Perry's asking, when you are starting okay. out as a copywriter, how soon can you start marketing yourself? You know, do I need to complete one course? And, you know, that's a, a million-dollar question. And, of course, you can start at any time. Um, and we encourage you to not wait. You're not going to be perfect. It's you, where you – from where you start to where you are in six months, 12 months, 18 months, you're just going to grow exponentially especially as you have the experience of working for a client. So, you know, you got to jump in the pool at some time. Bob, do you have an answer for that? Yes. What I think you, you should start with before you jump into it at, at, at seriously is you should try to build a portfolio of three samples for three different organizations, people, or businesses, get a testimonial from each, and – Ask each if you could use them as a reference. One way to do this is to write a fundraising letter for a local nonprofit. Say, you know, I just, I, I love, you know, I love animals. You're the local chapter of the ASPCA, 
and can I write a letter for you? You may not even charge him. Say, I'll do it in exchange for, I can post a letter on my website as a sample. I can, you're going to give me a testimonial if it works, and I can use you as a reference. You can also do that with uh, very small businesses owned by people you know, like friends uh, and relatives, and that's completely legitimate. You don't put, when you post the sample on your website, you don't say, I did this for Uncle Fred. You say, I did this for Barton Business Systems. So get three of each Good. to start. That way you have something. I love it. I love it. All right. This is going to be the last question. <laughs> um, Crassus is asking, I'm contemplating establishing a website to generate interest or sales for an e-novel that he's, or she, I'm sorry, I'm not sure, uh, entitled The Dogen Drawer. Uh, is it still a good idea to establish this website to generate interest? I, I mean, I think um, you obviously know more about this than I do, but I'm going to give my two cents here in that this is like a secret power that copywriters have that are also selling books is the ability to be able to create marketing materials for the book like a website. I mean, Bob, is there any reason people wouldn't create a, a website? Yeah, for there actually is. If you oh, want to okay. sell books online, nonfiction is easier to sell than fiction. If I today were going to self-publish a book of fiction, which I've never done, I have one book of fiction that was done with a regular publisher, I would uh, create a Kindle ebook and sell it on Amazon. Uh, if you if you Google uh, on Amazon, not Google. If you search Ben Settle, one of our friends on Amazon, you'll see he's got a series of horror novels. That's the best way to do it. Oh, okay. Well, excellent. I'm glad. Uh, I'm glad we had your expertise here, Bob, for that and for so much more. And with that. Uh, Bob and Pam, I want to thank you. We're getting some, some thank yous from the audience. What a great group here. These have been great, great thank you. questions. They, they were great questions, and I certainly thank you guys for uh, being on the program and, and, and listening. Yes. Oh, Bob, okay. it was awesome to have you with us. Pam, it's yeah. all, we par Pam and I partner a lot, and we always have fun. We do. I love it. Yep. <laughs> Oh, my gosh, lots of thank yous coming in. So, all right, this was awesome. I agree. And uh, until next time, bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye. -bye. Thank bye. You.